Hi, you're watching Journey to Stonehenge on the Time Team official YouTube channel with me, Tony Robinson. During the Stone Age, large round monuments called henges littered various bits of the landscape. If I was to ask you what the most famous one in Britain was, you'd probably say Stonehenge, which is, after all, pretty fantastic. But it's not the biggest. We're just over a mile from Stonehenge at a place called Darrington Walls. And this is Britain's biggest henge. Now, archaeologists believe they're on the verge of proving that these two great monuments were linked by water, life and death. Darrington Walls lies next to the River Avon, but you'd be hard-pressed to see it. Two roads now run across it, and ploughing has flattened its banks. But these are the remains of a huge man-made ring with two entrances. It's here that a team of top international archaeologists are rewriting what we know about prehistoric Britain and putting Darrington Walls back on the map. I always thought a henge was a bunch of standing stones in a field. Mm, and that's how the, the name originated, from Stonehenge. But actually, for archaeologists now, it's the name for an enclosure which has a bank on the outside instead of on the inside of the ditch. It's as if you're trying to keep something in rather than out. It's not, not defensive at all. What sort of data are we talking about? Well, henges are built really throughout the third millennium. So that's from 3000 BC to 2000 BC. And when they really go nuts about building them, it's in the middle of that millennium, around 2,500. And that's when this whole area of Wessex was like a massive building site. Within a 10-mile radius, you've got Avebury's standing stones, huge burial mounds and Stonehenge. So what was going on around here and what were henges for? It's all got to be pieced together through the archaeology. We're in the Neolithic with this henge. That's prehistory, four and a half thousand years ago. So no documents, no archives, just archaeology and lots and lots of ideas. Because this henge is unlike a lot of similar ones. It was buzzing with activity for hundreds of years. And that means thousands of really extraordinary finds. And these finds range from the everyday... Very fine example of a Neolithic arrowhead. We found two pieces of graveware. To the pretty unusual. This one is a chalk plaque, and it's been made by carving the surface. Something that we might think of as a Neolithic novelty. Maybe this is going to be the East Entrance erection. For four weeks, ten different universities, four archaeological units and countless experts are digging this henge as part of a ten-year project. The main area for excavation this year is around the outside of the henge near the river and promises to be the best yet. There's also a small trench across one of the banks of the henge. It's been put in by Mike Parker Pearson, one of the excavation leaders, to look at just what went into building this enormous structure. Antler picks used in the construction of the henge are all over the site and there's clear physical evidence of the sheer sweat involved. These are some of the large lumps of chalk yeah, that have come out. Yeah, you see lots of blocks in there, can't you? And they're really big and hard. These are the ones from the very base of the chalk. Yeah. So they'll come up last onto the bank. And we can get an idea of how much they really suffered right. when they got the stuff out. Yeah. Because if we look at some of these, can you see where the antler picks have been driven in. Oh, yes, and so they prise blocks them, out. And then they're trying to lever them off, to flake yeah. them off. There's uh, three or four stabs at that one. And, of course, it's at this time that we see people digging really big ditches and holes. But none as big as here. These white chunks give a tantalising glimpse into the appearance of the henge. 
it would have been a bright, gleaming white ring of chalk. And it would have been absolutely massive, with a ditch 16 metres wide and 6 metres deep, inside a 3 metre tall bank that stretched for almost a mile around the outside. There's nothing to compare it with today. This henge would have literally dominated the surrounding landscape. The act of transforming the landscape in those days on this scale yeah. would have been an act of enormous power and magic. Yeah, and organising the people to do it, of course. That's power as well. I think the logistics are interesting, you know. I mean, did these people measure things? You know, how did they organise the labour? You know, is it so many people from that settlement and this settlement? And you actually see that the, the repercussions are that most people in southern England, in some shape or form, must have been involved in these projects. Because if they weren't doing the work, they were supporting the people who were doing the work. But the Henge's construction is just the start of the story. Why make such a statement in the landscape? What was the purpose of Durrington Walls? Over almost a decade of research, Mike's developed a very unusual idea. One of the ideas that we're working with on this project is that Durrington Walls is a starting point of a transition into death. That in the Neolithic, you weren't simply alive and then dead, but it's all part of a really lengthy process, a long rite of passage, which may have involved the River Avon as part of it. The theory is effectively that we're seeing a progression into becoming ancestors, and your journey into death starts here. To test his theory, Mike's main trench is at the eastern entrance to the Henge, next to the river. He's hoping for clear evidence that lots of people were gathering here. But there's more to this theory. Cremated bone being brought for a special midwinter ceremony and carried down to the river, all sorts of feasting going on, and your ashes or even your bones being tossed into the water to find their way down to the land of the ancestors. It sounds incredible, but the amount and quality of the archaeology here is about to astound everyone. If you want us to investigate more sites, you can make it happen. So, help us reach 10,000 members on Patreon. Archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson and his team are trying to prove a groundbreaking theory that Durrington Wall's Henge was where thousands of people gathered to celebrate the newly dead. He's opened up an enormous trench outside the eastern entrance and there's archaeology literally everywhere. It's the proof that loads of people must have been coming here. And the preservation is staggering. They buried cooking material, the, the results of their feasts, into a series of pits. They're absolutely crammed full of bone and this pottery and This is this sort flint. of grey holes we can see here. That's it. The other aspect about these pits is that each and every one of these pits had an arrowhead in it. Right. Some of them had two, one even had three. <laughs> now, as well as that, we have bones of the animals that they'd eaten. And some of these bones have been arranged quite carefully. Right. So almost like the ribs around an animal, they place the rib bones around the sides of the ah, pit. Right. We have to be slightly careful about the, the nature of the sacredness, the ritual and so forth, yeah. because in amongst this, we're also finding dog feces. Oh, right. <laughs> so th that means that we're looking, I think, at material that's probably been scooped up Maybe the morning after the party, after the dogs have had a yeah, go through it through all, the bones and everything. then yeah. they've buried it. But not all the rubbish was neatly buried. Amazingly, this hearth still has the remains of cooking pots that smashed over the fire all that time ago. And there's a huge midden stretching up the trench, stuffed full of bones, cooking stones and broken pots. For a Neolithic site, the amount of rubbish is staggering, and it's yet further evidence that hundreds of people were congregating here to feast. And uh, this is 
It's a classic oh, yes. grooved ware. Of course, it's called grooved ware because it has grooves in it. That's the yeah. rib of one of these, and you see the slashes. This is one of these really big, That's right. sort of jar-like things. Great big these. flat bottom thing, about yeah. that big. Ideal for cooking with. But that's not all. There's a whole other story to piece together here at Durrington. Because in 1967, Durrington Wars hit the archaeological headlines with a dramatic discovery. This henge wasn't a big empty space. It actually contained two massive timber circles. And that means Durrington not only dwarfed Stonehenge, but it had mega structures of its own. Not stone, but wood. So was Durrington as important a monument? The 60s dig was massive. But it left a lot of unanswered questions. Now, one of the archaeologists' main goals is to get an accurate date to find out if the biggest circle was built at the same time as Stonehenge. Unfortunately, most of it's now underneath the road. But this deep trench is picking up where the 60s dig left off, excavating a slice of this southern circle. Cue waterproofs, as time team's Phil Harding talks enormous post holes with site director Julian Thomas. Let me get me bearings. We're on the western edge of the southern circle. That's right. So the centre of it is about where that tree is. Right. We're kind of taking a slice from the inside to the outside of the circle. So what have you got? Well, we've got a very nice white surface of chalk, which I think is really positive. That's all this stuff down That's here. That's all this stuff here. Right, yeah. Showing through that, we've got these big black splodges. These are going to be the post holes. That's one in yeah, there, one, one over there, there and one, one over there. there. Yeah. They're going to be absolutely massive when we get down through this stuff. Oh, you want some decent weather? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The 1967 excavation means the archaeologists already know that the circle measured 40 metres across with more than 100 upright posts, some over 10 metres tall. But they don't have a date for when it was put up or know for certain what the circle itself was used for. So digging the huge ramped post holes should help them find out. This massive timber circle would have been like a Neolithic Salisbury Cathedral and more than rivalled the stone circle at Stonehenge. And with the two sites less than three kilometres apart, Mike thinks they're related. Durrington Walls isn't just close to Stonehenge, it's actually linked to it by this river, the Avon. But some archaeologists believe that the two sites have got another more intriguing connection. The theory goes like this. Durrington Walls was the henge where people celebrated the newly dead. Then they began their journey downstream to Stonehenge, where the dead became spirits. In other words, Durrington was the start of the journey from death to the afterlife. It's a really romantic notion and very vivid, but do you actually have a scrap of evidence to support it? Well, we're just starting the excavation. What we're looking for is an avenue. If we find that, then that fully supports the theory. Why? What's the significance the of an significance avenue? The significance of an avenue from Durrington Walls to the river, in the same way that we have an avenue from the river to Stonehenge, will show that these are bound together, if you like, as a single complex. One solid route between Stonehenge and the walls. That's right, yes. And that's why the students are investigating this end of the trench at the eastern entrance. Because if Mike's right, then there should be an avenue or road leading out from here down to the river. Then along the river to Stonehenge. Stonehenge has long been associated with death because it was a cremation cemetery before the stones went up. But if it's connected to Durrington, then why does one have a stone circle and the other wood? 
Well, there's a unique theory about moving from wood to stone, and it's from an unusual source. It was something um, that really comes from Madagascar. Right. As I've been working for many years with a Malagasy archaeologist called Ramil Sonina, we were able to get Ramil over to come and look at Stonehenge. He comes from a stone building tradition. But, but still up, today. Still today. And when he saw Stonehenge, he <laughs> said, what do you mean you don't want, know what it's for? <laughs> and it must have been built for the ancestors. So not for, a problem as far as he was concerned? Certainly not, because, of course, in Madagascar, uh, the long dead who have become ancestors are commemorated as permanent entities through the medium of stone. It endures, whereas oh, nice. the temporariness of our lives and, of course, into death, that is something that is represented in timber and organic materials. Yeah. So life really is a process of hardening. But surely if we took somebody from Southeast Asia or somebody from North America, we, you might get other ideas that would sort of change mm. your view again. It's not something, something that is simply confined to Madagascar. Uh, in our own lives, we work with a similar sense of um, metaphor when we deal with our own dead. Because, right. for example, when we're buried, we may put up a wooden cross, a marker, which is temporary, until the permanent memorial in the form of a gravestone is set it's up. It's a gravestone, in fact. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah. The stoniness yeah. is terribly important. And up in the air, Mike continues the charm offensive in a bid to convince Mick. Now, we shouldn't really look at Stonehenge in isolation. It has an avenue that leads to it from the river, and if you go upstream, that's where you come to is Darrington Walls. I think we're looking at a linked series of monuments within this landscape, and they're linked as a religious entity. It is, is one of the problems, though, Mike. We can see them from the air, we can see them on maps. We, we make those connections. Is there a danger that we, we build too much about linkages in because we've got the maps and the air pictures, and it may not be the reality? I think we have to remember that rivers were very important to these people. Yeah. And of course, they are more likely to be the lines of movement that they use than, than we use today. More importantly, you know, we're seeing these two monuments, the timber circle, the stone circle, but they're accentuating the difference of these two materials. One that is permanent and everlasting yeah. and associated with the remains of the dead. The other one associated with the feasting debris of the living. You know, you could almost convince me. <laughs> but not, not quite. Not quite, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> well, convincing Mick might be easier than expected, because there's now been a fantastic discovery at the eastern entrance. By huge good luck, we've got a Neolithic road. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> we've never seen such a thing, and it's a monster. And what we're looking at is a road surface that's 10 metres across, and, of course, the river's just over there. This is a fantastic discovery. It's the first Neolithic road ever uncovered in Europe. The other half is under the spoil heap, so it's actually 20 metres wide. It's like a Neolithic mall. What we've got here is a gully. Is that with a sort of ditch on one that's side? That's right. This gully, uh, we think, will hold a series of small pits, possibly for palisade posts. Right. And then we have this spectacularly wide approach to the river. The road is this slightly darker, compacted surface, trampled by thousands of feet walking up and down it four and a half thousand years ago. For the first time, this is proof that the River Avon is the artery between the two henges. I think what's happening is that they're dumping ashes, maybe bodies, bones, into the river at this point, and they're making more of a spiritual journey down the river and residing as spirits at Stonehenge. OK, we've got one roadway, a tiny little bit of another roadway, and a windy river. But is there anything else tangible that might support Mike's theory? 
Well, I, I think that there's a lot of strength in the theory, to be quite honest. The river does provide a, a very real material connection between the two avenues. Um, and we know that rivers were very important landscape features in the Neolithic. But we certainly know from other um, parts of, of southern England and areas like the Thames, for instance, that objects are being deliberately deposited. And these can include things like stone axes, sometimes complete pottery vessels that might have had food offerings in them, but also occasional finds of human bone as well. Charlie, you're essentially a water specialist. Everything that they're saying assumes that the river was roughly in the same place four and a half thousand years ago as it is now, but we don't know that's necessarily the case, do we? I think it's more or less in the same spot. The floodplain is largely quite restricted by the terrains. But what you have to think about, the river is not like it is today. We see it as a managed, canalized, meander loop, set of loops. But it would have been a much more intriguing, entangled place and full of all sorts of really fantastic places and beautiful vistas. But that's enough theorising. Back on dry land, there's still a lot of digging to do. And the road is starting to take on a new and intriguing shape. The interesting thing about this line is the way that it curves round there. It's not actually straight. It looks as though we've got some sort of funnel arrangement so that, yes, people can come uh, charging out of the interior and, you know, 20 abreast, but, of course, by the time they get down to this point here, they're being funneled in together for their access to the river. So that's really exciting because this does suggest that we're seeing Neolithic crowd management actually in operation. And it seems those Neolithic crowds were partial to a lot of pork. We've got some extraordinary results from the analysis right. of the animal bones. So my colleague Umberto Alborella at Sheffield has been looking at the teeth of the pigs. Yeah. Now, these are not wild pigs, they're domestic. The pigs themselves yeah. have been raised on a high-calorie diet. Right. Um, they've got caries, bad well, they've teeth. They've got rotten teeth. They don't normally get old enough to have bad teeth, no, do they? No, yeah. but the interesting thing is that it's normally sweets and sugar That's right. that causes that. Yeah. And of course, there, there, you know, there was no sugar in yeah. the ne Neolithic. Are we looking at them feeding honey to their pigs? Something to flavour the meat, even, when they yeah, are killed. Yeah. Yeah. The pigs are actually shot with arrows really? in, stuck in their bones. That's very interesting. Because, mm. I mean, the traditional way is just to smash the front of the head in with a rock or something, That's isn't right, it? Yes. I mean, well, <laughs> I, I think this isn't, isn't a practical business, it's a lot of fun. What you're describing here is sort of like Olympic games of pig killing and eating. This sandwich. is conspicuous consumption. Yeah. You're yeah. basically doing them and you're roasting them, you're using up all their calories straight away yeah. and not preparing you for the lean months ahead at all. The other final conclusion is that these are being killed nine months after farrowing. So they're fairly young, in fact. Yeah, but they're farrowing once a year in the spring, so that puts age of death for the pigs at the midwinter period. Now, of course, that's a highly significant point of the year in this landscape. The sun rises on midwinter's day. Right. So what I wonder is if we're actually looking at a specific festival, which is the most important of the activities that took place in this particular henge. It's almost a sort of Bronze Age or Neolithic Christmas, isn't it? Yeah. The idea of a Stone Age Christmas is an extraordinary image and suggests gorging ourselves silly at massive parties is something we could owe directly to our Neolithic ancestors. But a rather unusual find on site suggests that food wasn't the only pleasure here. Is that what I think it is? So together we brought Time Team back and now we're going to take Time Team to the next level. Help us achieve 10,000 ongoing members on Patreon. Durrington Walls Henge was a hive of activity during the Neolithic. It's even bigger than Stonehenge and once contained massive timber circles. 
The archaeologists have discovered that the two sites are linked, but they don't know whether they were constructed at the same time. And getting that date could make or break a theory developed by archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson and his team. They see Durrington Walls as the starting place of a celebratory journey into death. But a strange artefact outside the Henge is throwing a new light on all the celebration. Is that a coincidence, or is that what I think it is? Well, it could well be a coincidence, but it's the context that's interesting. We got another one of these natural stones out of a pit last year, and that one had actually been modified to improve its appearance. But if that's a male sex organ, then mm. that's to do with things like birth and fertility. Mm. But you're saying that this site is about death. Mm. I think we've got to remember that in many cultures around the world, the two are intimately connected, death and fertility, death and sex. And when we're looking at the Neolithic in Britain, there are other sorts of sites where these things turn up. And back at base, the students are sorting through the thousands of other spectacular finds. This is a strikolite. We'll have the flint fabricator here and a piece of iron pyrites. And the way it works is just strike the two together. It's like a box of matches? Yes, portable fire. This is great, isn't it? We have these bone pins. This one's rather fragile. Has that got carving on it or is that just erosion from roots? It's a carved pig bone. It's highly polished on the surfaces as well. This decorative pin is pretty unusual and would have been used to fasten furs or clothes in place. All the time teams we've done, I don't think we've ever found such large pieces of prehistoric pot. No, they're fantastically preserved. They're absolutely incredible considering how fragile they are. And the great thing about them is, because they're being clearly made by a hand or a little tool, you really get a sense of the autograph of one single person who made that. Mm. Yeah. Yes. What would they have been for? Well, as far as we can tell, they were rather large cooking vessels. Analysing the pots gives a fascinating insight not just into the diet of Neolithic people, but also into their farming and cooking methods. We take a potsherd from an excavation like this and we clean the surface and then we grind that up and uh, remove the fat that's preserved within the potsherd. What species of animals have you got represented? Well, you can see on this graph here, we can start to separate the species a little bit so we can distinguish between porcine carcass fats, um, ruminant carcass fats. Now, let, 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 let's, let, let's, let's find out what sort of animals these are. OK. Is this a one that goes a moo <laughs> or, or a ba? <laughs> uh, these are the pig fats. Right. And ruminant, um, that can either be cattle, sheep or goat. And then this one here is um, dairy fats. And have you got a lot of one particular species in, in, in the pots? At Durrington Walls, we had a really high percentage of pig fats, more than we saw at any other site. OK, so... We've got a lot of pig fats. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about the sort of processes, the actual things that they were using these pots for? It's possible that they are putting some of, some of the roasted meat into the pot and bo boiling it. You half cook it in the fire and you take it out and you make a stew. You then ha have a stew that you can add greens to, to add pulses to and wheat to, to thicken it. How about the dairy fats? What's that? Well, that, yeah, that's telling us that farming is quite sophisticated in, the, in that they're probably making cheese, possibly drinking milk, using butter. But, of course, Sally, it wasn't only meat products that they were eating. They were also vegetable materials as well. Yes, this is Emma. And, in fact, we know from one of the pots there's a, there's a mark on the pot that seems to be a grain. Oh, yeah. Very distinctive oval shape in there. Hmm. Let's stick it in. Hmm. There we go. Yeah, that's it. Works right. On. But things don't stop with the minute. Another incredibly rare find is the first definite evidence that Durrington wasn't just for special occasions. We've actually found the floor of a house. Now, it's not a very big house. It's only four metres that way by four metres this way. So 16 square metres, fairly small place to raise a family. It's simply built. It has stake holes along its sides, supporting a wall made of wattle and daub. So timber facade really covered with chalk plaster. We don't know what the roof was like. My guess is it would have been thatched. And uh, here it is sitting with a fine view out over 
the avenue, the procession route down to the river. Now, it's not alone. There are actually more houses here than we'd realised. We found another one over there. There's another one down there. And we had traces of a small stake arrangement, part of a fourth house over there. What's really exciting about this house is that it's the first time we have found the floor layer for a Neolithic house preserved anywhere in England. We can actually walk on the very surface that people walked on four and a half thousand years ago. And that's not all. Inside the house, some personal finds. And this one is a chalk plaque, which would have originally been square with a sort of raised boss in the middle. And it's been made by carving the surface. This has again been carved. We assume it's used as a lamp because it resembles um, some of the lamps that have been found in Neolithic flint mines of the period. The house is a brilliant discovery, and Mike thinks there may have been hundreds of them around the banks of the Henge, which completely alters the picture of how it looked during the Neolithic. And as the dig progresses, Mike's road also seems to be changing as a striking feature materialises. The big surprise, though, is here, just on the edge of the road, what this looks like to me is the top of a post hull for an enormous post. So we're probably looking at something, piece of timber this much in diameter, but it raises the possibility that there may have been another one on the other side of the road, 10 metres that way, and who knows, possibly more all the way into the entrance of the Henge. So this looks to me like it could be a terrific discovery. The road's now looking more and more impressive, like a ceremonial route leading to the river one way and towards our timber circle the other way. All these discoveries are painting a vivid picture of ceremonies here four and a half thousand years ago. It's winter 2500 BC, and thousands of people are coming to Durrington from miles around. They've all brought the cremated remains of their loved ones who've died throughout the year. They shoot some pigs, feast on the pork, and have a special ceremony to remember those who've died. As the midwinter sun rises, they process down to the river where they empty their ashes. These then float downstream into the land of the afterlife, Stonehenge. But where inside this massive henge would ceremonies actually take place? Well, the answer could lie within the wooden posts of the Southern Circle. Here we're getting into the tops of these very large post holes. They're, yeah. They're going to be absolutely massive. It's going to be two, two and a half metres wide and two metres deep. So what sort of trees do you reckon they've been? Well, I think the idea was that they were oak. Obviously very big, if that sort of diameter. Yeah. Have you found anything inside the post holes yet? Not yet, it's early days. From the post holes alone, it's still difficult for the archaeologists to get a handle on what this timber circle would have looked like or what it was for. And that's where Time Team comes in. We're going to bring together Phil and a whole host of experts on an ambitious project that's part philosophy, part empathy and part building site. We're going to go back over 4,000 years in time to recreate the Southern Circle here at Durrington. It'll be the biggest project of its kind ever to take place in Britain. The largest post weighs more than five tonnes and we've decided to put this one up by hand, just as the Neolithic people did. We've got 20 soldiers, Phil Harding, and a wood specialist. The problem is we're not really sure how Neolithic people did it. I mean, have you got any idea how they'd have actually got these posts up? Well, given that they've got these ramps, we know pretty much that they'd be toppling the post into the hole in the first place and then pulling it up but we've got very little idea about precisely how they'd go about doing that. John, this is where your expertise comes in. How do you reckon they did it? Well, I think they probably used an A-frame. The ideal pull is 90 degrees if you're trying to pull a post up. If you flatten the angle, you're losing advantage. All you're trying to do is pull it into the ground. You're not trying to lift it. So the A-frame is actually lifting the rope 
up and over. Adam, is this the sort of task you normally get your soldiers to do? Uh, not really, no, no. <laughs> but it's very good because it gives them an opportunity to practice their skills, which is something we try and engender within the armed services. Based on what they know so far, the archaeologists have calculated that the circle would have had two huge entrance posts and then 166 other posts of varying sizes stretching 40 metres across. It probably would have taken hundreds of people a century to plan and construct. But we're giving ourselves just a week. This is Neolithic engineering and architecture on an epic scale and Time Team's biggest ever reconstruction. Timber and stone circles have long been associated with the summer solstice. They've got markers that are deliberately aligned with specific sunrises and so act a bit like giant calendars or clocks. For hundreds of years, people have gathered at places like Stonehenge to celebrate the midsummer solstice. 20 centimetres away from you. Clive Ruggles is plotting out our reconstruction of the Southern Circle, and in doing so, he's discovered something that challenges how we've interpreted stone and timber circles in the past. The difference about Durrington from Stonehenge is that the horizons aren't equal in the equally high in the different directions. So at Stonehenge, it works both ways. Midsummer sunrise, everyone knows, one way. Midwinter sunset, the other way. But um, here at Durrington, um, this southern circle points at midwinter sunrise one way, but doesn't point in midsummer, su uh, midsummer sunset the other way because the horizon's too high. So this southern circle is deliberately aligned on the midwinter sunrise, and it, and it, it, it looks not that they're looking back, but they're, they're looking forward to the regeneration of the new year. Well, I think so. I th there's always this debate about whether midsummer or midwinter, the longest day or the shortest day, are likely to be more significant. Both may be significant, but this shortest day with, as you say, the regeneration, I think we're finding a lot more alignments that seem to be midwinter than midsummer. And I, for one, don't find that too surprising. To me, this really does make sense. Why would Neolithic people celebrate a time when the nights get longer and days colder? They'd be looking for the signal that things were about to get better. The midwinter sun rising between the huge entrance posts of the timber circle. And this fits in neatly with Mike's theory that funerals and feasts were happening at a special time of year. The people at Durrington could let their Neolithic hair down, celebrating those who died, but at the same time, celebrating the birth of a new year ahead. At our reconstruction, the team are ready to lift our first timber. But weighing in at five tonnes, it's not going to be easy. Go on my string and see what happens. And, uh. Right, so these guy ropes are actually quite important. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go do the real thing. There might not be evidence for A-frames on the site, but we do know that they were being used elsewhere in the world at this time, and it seems the most logical way to get a post up. OK, guys, we can move away now. Okay, so we're not being totally authentic by using some mechanical help, but we can calculate that by replacing men for each pulley, you'd be looking at 100 men to lift this one post up in the Neolithic. I declare the post upright, guys. It's going to be like a temple, it really is. Yeah. Now the experimental bit's done, Bring on the machines. There's a huge job ahead to get the other 167 in place. All of this wood was mechanically felled from managed woodland, and we've got the luxury of machines. But imagine cutting down around five acres of forest with primitive tools, dragging the timbers across land and rivers and erecting posts using rope and manpower. 
it would have been a supreme effort. It's a frantic pace, but our builders are having fun. Despite the odd hiccup. <laughs> We've lost, have we lost these bees? No, no there's no, one not. there. But as machines scoop out the massive post holes, it's an altogether slower process at the Southern Circle. I think we're almost there now. Yeah, it shouldn't be much further down to go. When you consider the last person who stood in this post hole did so four and a half thousand years ago, and you're effectively doing the same thing that they did, emptying out a big hole. And as they've gone deeper, they've started to find remains of antler picks used to dig the actual post holes. But other artefacts are also coming out, and these are painting a rather different picture. Julian started to think that this was a ceremonial site even after the timbers rotted away. And the finds could be from people burying offerings in old post holes centuries later. Hang on, Julian. If you were going to dig a hole somewhere, why would you dig it in the one place in a field where there was already something in a hole? I think it's a deliberate act of commemoration, that you're commemorating the post having been here. So it's a way of remembering this whole monument centuries after it's disappeared. Julian, it's an attractive idea, all these people going, ah, and casting all their rubbish <laughs> into right. these old holes, remembered from hundreds of years previously. But is there actually any evidence in the ground that this is what they were doing? That's what we're looking for. One of the things we've got to go for is a really tight set of radiocarbon dates so that we can say, when were these holes dug and when was the stuff going into them? But news of the radiocarbon date has a dramatic impact on Mike's theory. Join a thriving worldwide community of Time Team fans on Patreon. Your ongoing membership enables us to develop more sites and more episodes The archaeologists at Darrington Walls Henge have been trying to build up a picture of what went on here and what things looked like four and a half thousand years ago. And we're filling in some of the blanks as we finally unveil our complete reconstruction of its sudden circle. Two 10 metre entrance posts, 166 other timbers, six concentric rings measuring 40 metres across. It's spectacular. have a lot of respect for the people who put this up, don't you? I mean, apart from anything else, these trunks are so massive. But the other thing is that as soon as you're in here, your mind starts racing about what they would have originally looked like. I mean, there's no reason to assume that they would have been this nice, attractive pine colour. Maybe they were really gaudy. Maybe they were painted reds and mauves and purples. They could have been carved, couldn't they, like totem poles. Maybe they had lots of votive offerings hammered up all over them. And another idea they've got is that, that there would have been great sheets of cloth pinned between all the trunks which billowed and waved in the wind. I rather like that one. And these things, these low trunks, are very odd, aren't they? Maybe these are the posts of a fence so that when you first approach this site, you'd be able to see all the towering architecture, but you wouldn't be able to see the people inside. So whereas now, when we look at it, it looks rather arty and comforting and all these lovely solitary trunks, originally, you might have felt really different. You'd be able to see how they dominated the skyline, but what you wouldn't be able to see is all the strange, weird, mysterious ritual that went on inside. But what about a date for the Southern Circle? If it's the right date, this could finally prove the theory that Durrington Wars was linked to Stonehenge. If it's not, then we could be looking at a whole new theory. 
We've been waiting and waiting for the date of this antler, which is key. But now you've got it, and you still haven't told me. Well, it's slap on 2500 BC. So what does that mean? Well, it might have been one of two things. This antler could have been to do with the construction of the timber circle, or it might have told us about the redigging of the pits over the tops. 2500 is just when we imagine that that monument was being constructed, so I think that's what it's telling us. Despite typical archaeologist fence-sitting, this is really fantastic news. This radiocarbon date is proof that the timber circle was built at exactly the same time as Stonehenge's circle. And it just adds to the appeal of the archaeologist's theory that the timber circle was the start of a ritual journey from Durrington to Stonehenge. I like the idea that they were a, a commemoration of things in recent memory, recent events or recent deaths. Well, my money's on Sacred Temple, the place that relates to the cosmos as people understood it, what they saw in the landscape, what they saw in the sky. An area where people are actually negotiating, forging alliances with, with, with other groups, other communities. Meeting places, maybe markets. A place where people can gather and feel that they're in somewhere that's different. I'd like to believe that it was a, a kind of a man-made natural copse or forest. You're almost in a woodland, and it is a totally different feeling. Perhaps they're erecting these posts individually as groups, and all those posts are at different rates of decay, and that they actually represented different things to different people. I think the timber circles were more about the building of them, the people coming together to bring their timbers in and construct them. An expression of what later became art, later became religion, later became politics, later became society. I mean, politics will always be involved. The, the massive evidence we have for feasting, having a bit of fun, but also at the same point in time, but basically sort of establishing social relationship. An expression of being human in the landscape, passionate, mad, creative. It's so huge, it evolved moving masses of people, masses of trees, vast distances. It was something about human yearning, human creativity. I think the key find for the whole season for me has been discovering that there really was an avenue between Darrington Walls and the river. We've been looking for it for seven years. <laughs> you were so excited, <laughs> weren't you? It was like, those crazy fools, they wouldn't believe me, and now I can prove I'm right. And the lovely thing about it is it's, it's really substantial. We've never seen a Neolithic road anywhere in Europe. If it's the first Neolithic road in Europe, mm. I mean, that's serious archaeology, isn't mm. it? I think it is, because, uh, you know, this is a seriously important area at that time, and they don't do things by halves at Darrington and Stonehenge. You know, we're seeing the biggest and the best. After all the work that you've done here, what's the picture in your head of what was going on here during the Neolithic? I think we have to envisage that place just crawling with thousands of people and having the biggest parties you could think of. And they're also working extremely hard, digging five metres down vertically into the chalk to construct those huge ditches, dragging these enormous timbers from who knows where and setting them up. So I think it would have been the most extraordinary place. It's like Glastonbury on the Tuesday after everyone's left, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a bit like Glastonbury mixed with building the Millennium Dome and uh, probably putting in a motorway or two at the same time. <laughs> we can finally complete our picture of what Durrington Walls would have looked like four and a half thousand years ago. A focus for building, gathering and ceremony. Darrington Walls Henge may have been ignored, damaged and misunderstood over the years, but the work here is changing that. This is a place where hundreds of people gathered to feast, celebrate and commemorate life and death over 4,000 years ago. This henge is at the very heart of a huge ancestral landscape.
Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind-the-scenes insights.